This is the USS Zumwalt, a ship once introduced to the world as a curious experiment in naval stealth, now becoming the first US surface combatant refitted to carry the Navy's new hypersonic conventional prompt strike weapon, an upgrade that makes China's no-go zones suddenly very goable. For years, the Zumwalt class was defined by its contradictions. A stealth destroyer with a futuristic silhouette, armed with two 155mm advanced gun systems that had no affordable ammunition. It was mocked, misunderstood, and mischaracterized. In other words, a billion-dollar meme with a hull number. But in naval engineering, initial purpose rarely determines final destiny. And by 2025, as documented in NAVC releases, shipyard imagery, and Department of Defense budget books, Zumwalt had entered a transformation phase that changes not just its mission, but the balance of power across the Pacific. The evidence is clear. NAVC outlined plans to remove both AGS turrets, and by 2024 the guns and magazines were taken out and the shipyard began installing launch hardware for 12 conventional prompt strike missiles. In their place, engineers fitted four large hypersonic launch canisters that together can carry a dozen CPS rounds. CPS is the Navy's hypersonic boost glide weapon derived from the joint Army-Navy LRHW program. It uses a solid fuel booster to loft a common hypersonic glide body into the upper atmosphere, and then rides a low, maneuvering trajectory at hypersonic speed. Open source reporting and budget documents describe CPS as a Mach 8 class system with a range well over 1,600 kilometers, with many assessments placing it in the roughly 2,500 kilometer class with the exact strike distance still classified. This distinction matters because China's naval and air defense architecture was never optimized for this class of weapon. The People's Liberation Army Navy built its interceptors around two basic flight profiles, the low-altitude cruise missile band occupied by weapons like the Tomahawk and the high, relatively predictable arc of ballistic missiles. CPS sits between those categories. Too low for their ballistic defenses, too fast for their cruise missile playbook, the tactical equivalent of showing up to a basketball game with chess rules. It is designed to complicate the fire control assumptions behind long-range systems like the HHQ-9 and HQ-19, and to challenge the tracking performance of the large radars aboard ships such as the Type 055. When Zumwalt's upgrade is complete, it becomes the first U.S. surface warship able to strike high-value land or naval targets from well beyond the reach of any known Chinese ship-launched anti-ship missile, and from ranges comparable to China's most advanced land-based systems like the DF-17. China spent two decades building weapons to keep American carriers roughly a thousand miles away. The U.S. response was to take a radar-minimized destroyer, sail it inside that envelope, and arm it with a weapon that can reach far beyond China's longest surface-launched missile. For Beijing, CPS is not just a new threat. It is a geometry problem their calculators weren't built for. But while the surface fleet is making that leap, something even more consequential is happening beneath the waterline. Congressional reports and commercial satellite imagery show the unmistakable shape of an 84-foot hull insert staged outside General Dynamics' electric boat in Groton, Connecticut. This is the Virginia payload module, the most significant increase in American submarine firepower since the Cold War. The VPM is being integrated into Virginia-class Block 5 submarines, a configuration described in detail by the Navy's Program Executive Office for Submarines, NAVC, and the Congressional Research Service. Earlier Virginia-class boats carried 12 Tomahawk missiles in bow-mounted vertical tubes, supplemented by weapons launched from the torpedo room. Block 5 changes that math. The VPM adds four large-diameter vertical payload tubes amidships, each capable of holding seven Tomahawk cruise missiles or other large-diameter payloads. That is 28 additional Tomahawks. Combined with the existing bow tubes and torpedo room-loaded weapons, the total load of Tomahawk-class missiles rises to roughly 65 per submarine, with some analysts noting that certain configurations could push the number of cruise missiles into the low 70s. In practical terms, Block 5 is the closest successor to the retiring Ohio-class SSGN arsenal submarines. And these aren't legacy Tomahawks. The Block 5 upgrade brings a new generation of Tomahawk cruise missiles with a range of over a thousand kilometers, upgraded guidance, and a maritime strike seeker capable of engaging moving ships. They fly a sea-skimming terminal profile designed to exploit radar horizon limits. A Chinese Type 055 cruiser can only detect a sea-skimming target at a distance on the order of a few tens of kilometers, 
roughly 20 to 40 kilometers, depending on radar height and conditions. Translation? If 60 tomahawks pop over the horizon at once, the first indication the crew gets might be the fire alarm. Vertical launch cells cannot reload in time. Combat management systems must track and sort targets faster than they can be engaged. Close-in weapon systems are forced to choose which leakers to prioritize in seconds. This is why U.S. Navy, RAND, and CRS assessments all highlight that large submarine-launched cruise missile salvos could overwhelm even advanced air defense formations, including Chinese carrier groups. At the same time, China's surface fleet has expanded rapidly, but its anti-submarine warfare has lagged. Open-source ONI and CRS summaries point out limitations in hull-mounted sonars on ships like the Type 052D, the difficulty of tracking quiet submarines across complex ocean layering, and gaps in helicopters' sauna buoy coverage in deep water. Block 5 submarines with improved quieting, advanced coatings, and modern sensor suites are designed to exploit those weaknesses. If you can't hear the submarine, you don't get to complain about the missiles. Operating beneath the thermocline, the boundary layer that severely attenuates many ASW systems, a Block 5 boat can maneuver, fire a saturation strike, and slip away before Chinese sensors can generate a reliable firing solution in return. But the most subtle change, the one altering the geometry of the Pacific more than any missile, is not explosive at all. It is the MQ-25 Stingray, the U.S. Navy's first operational carrier-based refueling drone. For years, the greatest vulnerability of American carriers was not their defenses, but their reach. The F-35C, the Navy's most advanced strike fighter, has a combat radius of roughly 700 nautical miles without refueling. China's anti-ship ballistic missiles, the DF-21D and DF-26, have engagement envelopes measured in thousands of kilometers. That mismatch created a simple assumption. To launch strikes, carriers would have to sail into the heart of China's missile threat rings. That assumption is now breaking. NAVAIR and Boeing releases confirm that through 2024 and 2025, the MQ-25 completed full flight deck handling integration aboard USS George H.W. Bush. Taxi operations, low procedures, engine run-ups, elevator cycling, and catapult alignment alongside manned aircraft. Congressional reports describe a refueling profile in which MQ-25 can offload on the order of 15,000 pounds of fuel at several hundred nautical miles from the carrier. In practice, that adds roughly 500 to 600 nautical miles of reach to an F-35C strike package. In other words, China built giant missile rings, and the Navy just stepped outside them. This changes geometry. With MQ-25 support, a carrier can now operate on the order of 1,500 miles from the Chinese coastline, far enough to complicate DF-21D engagement geometry and significantly stress the broader DF-26 kill chain, while still putting stealth aircraft over key targets. And while Chinese missiles can theoretically reach that far, the real bottleneck is not range, but targeting. Long-range anti-ship ballistic missiles require a continuous targeting chain. Satellites, long-range radars, maritime patrol aircraft, and drones all feeding track data into a fire control solution. Many open-source assessments note that China's satellite constellations have revisit times often measured in hours, not minutes. Over-the-horizon radars can cut but not precisely track individual ships at that distance. Continuous UAV coverage across the Western Pacific is expensive and vulnerable. If the carrier moves between satellite passes, the entire Chinese kill chain is basically guessing which pixel to aim at. Individually, each of these upgrades would be disruptive. Together, they form a triad that the current Chinese fleet was not designed to counter. Zumwalt-class destroyers provide stealthy, hypersonic surface strikes that outrange China's ship-launched missiles. Virginia Block 5 submarines provide deep magazines of long-range cruise missiles, capable of saturating even high-end air defenses from beneath the sea. MQ-25 extends the carrier air wing's reach and helps detach U.S. carrier operations from the most dangerous parts of China's missile engagement zones, while simultaneously stressing the targeting systems those missiles depend on. China built a navy optimized for a previous era, an era in which American carriers had to operate close to shore. Submarines carried relatively modest arsenals, and surface ships relied on cruise missiles that followed predictable flight paths. The U.S. Navy of 2025 looks different. It is integrating hypersonics on stealth destroyers, arsenal-like payloads on attack submarines, and unmanned refueling aircraft into carrier air wings. The geography of the Pacific hasn't changed. The physics, the ranges, speeds, and trajectories that define who can shoot what from where, have. The balance of power in the Pacific wasn't simply adjusted. 
it was recalculate, and any fleet built around the old equation now faces a new problem. The rules have already moved. Bye for now.